from which we'll talk about the Schuerhorn theorem and why it's good for linear optimization. So I think this year, unlike previous years, uh, majorization is not something that you're familiar with because uh, I've asked and uh, apparently majorization is, wasn't done in the QIT course last year. So it's a fresh topic for you. Okay, so I will try and, I, I have majorization included in this lecture, but uh, please do interrupt me if you need a bit more detail as I've gone through the, uh, as I go through the examples. Okay, so let's start first with passivity. And this is actually a very simple concept. So imagine I have a state rho and I can transform it, I'm allowed to transform it via any unitary operation. Then what we can do is we can consider all possible unitary operations and ask which of them lowers the energy of rho the most. And the reason is because as I uh, discussed yesterday, since globally energy is conserved, if I do a unitary operation that lowers the energy of my system, it means that en that energy must now appear on the machinery that carried out the unitary operation. And so what I do is I define what we call the ergotropy. Um, which I denote by epsilon of rho. And this is the, uh, well, let me do it this way. The maximum of all unitaries of trace of H, where H is the Hamiltonian of this system, minus trace of H on the final state when I perform a unitary operation. Okay. Very good. Um, yes, so this is initial minus final, which gives us the energy that we've extracted or the energy that we pick in. Um, of course, you know that I can always get this to be zero by picking the, um, the initial state, the final state to just be the initial state. So I can always achieve a value of zero. The question is whether I can achieve something that's greater than zero, so that's positive, okay? And if this is zero, which would be the statement that no matter what unitary I do, I cannot lower the energy of the state, I can only put in energy, then we say that rho is passive. Okay, so a passive state is simply one on which no matter what unitary operation I do, I cannot extract energy from it. I cannot lower its energy. I will only end up putting energy into it. Okay. And so now I'd like to discuss, before I write down how you would classify a state as passive or not, I would like to point out in a very intuitive way, two ways you can see that the state cannot be passive. So, so it's not passive if, so one simple way is, if there is an inversion, so there is an inversion. And an inversion, remember, is I have E, M, so some energy level of the system, some pair of energy levels, M greater than N, and E, M greater than P, N. So the population in a high energy state is greater than the population in a low energy state. If I have this, I instantly know it's not passive. And the reason is we can see this very simply with a qubit example. So imagine that I have the, I have this Hamiltonian E11 on a qubit and I have a state rho, which is, let's put it in density matrix form, 0 0.4, 0, 0, 0 0.6. So it just has more population in the higher energy state, the one state than in the zero state. Of course, if I transform this now to, if I do a unitary operation that just swaps zero and one, and I make this 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0, 0, this has a lower average energy. In this case, the average energy is 0 0.6 times E, of course. And here, E average prime is 0 0.4 times E. So it's rather straightforward if I have a population inversion, it definitely cannot be passive. There's a very trivial unitary that will do it for us. But the other case that's also interesting is if there are coherences, which is 
em not equal to en and the density matrix rho mn, which is, let's say, em rho en is not equal to zero. Let's do it this way. So I have two energy levels, which are non-degenerate, and I have a non-zero element between them. Um, why is this the case? When we discuss majorization, you see a algebraic way to understand why this is the case. But we can again use qubits um, to form an intuition. So take the following example. Imagine that I have the state plus in the same Hamiltonian. So we keep the Hamiltonian the same. And I start with the state plus. This has the plus state, as you know, if I write it in the energy basis, it's equally probable to be in 0 or 1. It has coherences, and it's equally probable to be in 0 and 1. So I could write this as half, 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 and half. That's the density matrix of a system. And of course, I can easily do a unitary to change this to the state 0. So it's just a unitary that takes plus to 0, and it can take, for example, minus to 1. So that's a unitary operation. But that, of course, has a lower average energy, because here, E average is equal to half times E. And with this, E average is equal to 0. And the way of looking at it is when you have coherences, you are always able to apply a rotation in that, in that subspace, which allows you to push, pop, push population in either way that you want, either to the, to the first one or the second one. You can always do this. When you have no coherences and it's, on, and it's only 0, 0 is in the off diagonal, then when you try to apply a rotation, you always end up pushing population from the one that has more to the one that has less. But when there is coherences, you have some freedom. Another way of looking at this is by looking at the block sphere of this whole setup. So imagine I draw the block sphere here, and I'll put the state 1 on the top and the state 0, 0 at the bottom. This is, let me draw this a new thing. This is getting very small. So I draw the block sphere. I put this is the z axis, but I invert it to how we usually do it. So I put zero on the top. So that's z. And then of course, so that's the let's call this plus states, and then you have the y axis there. Okay, now the nice thing about writing the block sphere. In this fashion, when the Hamiltonian is um, is one that is basically uh, proportional to sigma z or some projector on sigma z, is that we can then write that all of these planes, so I can draw this plane here, is constant E average. So basically, when you write the state of the block sphere, it's going to be a point in this, uh, the state of the system. It is a point in the block sphere. And everything that is on the same plane in Z has constant E average, because it will have the same population with respect to the 0, 1 basis. OK. And now the second thing now you combine this intuition with is the fact that if I have a point in the block sphere and I ask, what are all of the states that I can get by doing unitary operations on it, what you do get is all of the points in the block sphere that are of the same radius from the center. So of course, for pure states, it's simple. If you're on the surface of the block sphere, then using unitary operations, you can get to any other uh, pure state. But the same thing applies to, to everything else. So if I, if I start with a state, oh, okay, let me draw this first, because I'm not good with drawing circles. So imagine this is my circle. Yeah, so if I start with a state at this point here, then the whole blue circle is u rho u dagger. Okay, and now some. Now we can see very clearly if you start with something that's on the axis of the block sphere. So imagine now I start with a state at this point here. Then you cannot go further on the axis. You can only go on the circles. You can get basically within the the, the circle on the block sphere. So from here you see if I start on the axis closer to zero. Then the only thing that can happen if I do a unitary operation is I can increase the energy because I, I start at the bottom of the circle, I can only go up. Whereas if I start closer to one, which is the case of an inversion, I'm actually closer to the excited state than to the ground state, 
then the only thing I can do with the unit tree is actually decrease energy. So I, I will extract energy. And importantly, if I start not on the z-axis, but with any coherence between the energy eigenstates, which means I do not begin on this axis, I begin somewhere with away from it. So let's say at this point or the original row, then I can always go up or down depending on which direction I rotate it. So with coherences, you can always extract energy. Okay. And so with this now, I will write down actually the formally how you can see that a state is passive. So rho is passive if and only if these two conditions are satisfied. So one, rho is so block diagonal with respect to H or the same thing as saying rho commutes with H. And the second is that the eigenvalues of rho are decreasing Oh, actually, it need not be decreasing. It can be non-increasing. So let me write that. Non-increasing with respect to energy. OK. So the second thing that I said is basically the the, the um, condition of no inversions. And the first thing is indeed to eliminate the possibility of co coherences. Now, there is an important part of this. So I, this is and, because both have to be satisfied. The important part is that I said the eigenvalues and not the populations, because when they are degeneracies, there is a little bit of a tricky thing one must be aware of. So imagine the following Hamiltonian. I just take it, it's a three level system. The ground state is zero energy and it's degenerate between the first and the second excited states. Um, right. So this would be, this, the energy level diagram would look something like that. That's zero, one, two. Okay. And imagine now I take a density matrix that is of this form. Okay, so I take it to be 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, and here I'm going to consider two cases. I'm going to make this x and this x 0, 0, 0, 0. OK. And the cases for x are the following. So if I say that, so one case is going to be x, let's say x1 is 0 0.1. And in the second case, I take x2 to be 0 0.2. So I can even label this as row x, so I have two different x's, okay? Oh, actually not 0 0.2, we take the okay, 0 0.3. Okay, and now the reason I um, I say they have to say eigenvalues is, by construction, this is already block diagonal with respect to the Hamiltonian, because I have the first, the ground state subspace and the first excited subspace with the two levels and they're zero, so it's already block diagonal. But what I see on the diagonal elements are the populations, they are not the eigenvalues. And the point is the following, as I already pointed out, when you have coherence, you are able to push population between one and the other one. So what one can check is, if you have x1 is equal to 0 0.1, what you can do is you can get a unitary operation to concentrate the population to the point where it's 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and 0, 0. This is 0, and zero is here. And this is again, you, you, simply, um, you simply take this space and you do a rotation between these two states. Whereas if it is 0 0.3, and that's actually the easier one to see because if you have 0 0.3, then this whole thing looks like the plus state that we had there where all four elements are equal. And as we know, when you have a plus state in a subspace, you can rotate it to basically the zero, the ground state or the excited state of that subspace. So in the case of 0 0.3, you can actually get all of the population concentrated and so, yeah, let me just go here. And you will end up with 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0, and then zeros everywhere else. And this, of course, 
is not passive because now you have a higher population in a high energy state. So this is why you have to look at the eigenvalues rather than just the populations themselves. Okay. Are there any questions? No. This concludes talking about passivity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ah, sorry, you wanted to do, do ah, on the block sphere there. Uh, no, because this is uh, this was this is a different example because in the block sphere one was to talk about if you have two different energies, then indeed you cannot have any coherence between them because you can always go one way or the other. And so the only way you can be passive is if you are really on the axis and on the side where you have higher population in the low energy state. This, the, 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 this example was to point out that when you have a degenerate subspace, then yes. So the populations within that subspace doesn't matter for passivity at all because they're all equal energies. But because you could concentrate them, then it might matter relative to another subspace. So you have to always look at the eigenvalues. Yeah. Um, so the actual unitary there. Uh, so I think the, the easiest way to do it would be what you can do with that density matrix, the where it's 0 0.1, is you can write it as um, a sum of two different ones. Um, one of which is is just diagonal, and the other one of which has the 0 0.1, just the 0 0.1s left in all of them. So basically you leave 0.2 of the population in just the diagonal one and 0.1 in the other one. And then you do the, 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 um, the unity that goes from the plus to the zero in that subspace. So it will not affect the one that's completely diagonal because it'll be proportional to identity in that one. But in the other one, it will rotate all of it into into that. So, so that's why you will be left with the basically the 0 0.2 at the bottom, but the other 0 0.1 has now switched to the other one. Yeah. Yes, you could. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, this would be the it would be the same in terms of then the passivity thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, indeed, yes, indeed, yeah. So you can always indeed still break it down to whether all of the qubit subspaces you have are, are fine, but yeah, you have to reason it then subspace by subspace. Okay, so that brings us now to majorization. Okay, um, so the concept of majorization is is most, so it is a, is a, it is a property on vectors, let me write down what the property is first. So imagine that you have um, vectors A and B, okay? And now what I mean by vectors, I'm going to always use the fact that, um, so they are basically population vectors. So the A is sum over, let's say, AI, and then of course, a sum basis EI. Um, and, we have that the AI are all greater or equal to zero and sum over AI is equal to one, okay? So you can actually, the easiest way of thinking about this is the diagonal elements of a density matrix is an example. It's a population vector, all of the values are greater than zero 
and the sum of them is one if it's a normalized density matrix. Then the same thing for B, okay? So what I can do then is I can construct the ordered A and B. So A ordered is basically A, but with decreasing values. So I take the I take the list of the, um, the values in the vector and I simply reorder them so that I have the largest first, then the second, then the third, then the fourth. So it's in, in decreasing order. Okay. And again, the same thing for B. So A, B, doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Now we say that A majorizes B if only if for every, let's say, n sum over i is equal to 1 to n a i, the ordered version, is greater or equal to sum from i is equal to 1 to n of b i, the ordered version. OK? So. Let me pick the examples that I have. Okay. So, right. So, one simple example that we can pick. Example A is equal to the following vector. 3, 2 over 3, 1 over 3. And B is equal to just the maximally mixed one. OK. And now remember, before we do the majorization check, you always have to reorder them. So A ordered would be 2 over 3, 1 over 3, 0. And B ordered would be the same. Oh. The same as before. Yeah. OK, and now from the A ordered and B ordered, we can see that A majorizes B. If I do the sum, I basically am doing the sum of the first n largest elements from A and the first n largest elements from B. So if I just do it of the first one, I have 2 over 3 and 1 over 3. It's fine. If I do it on the second one, it's this plus that. That's 1, and this is 2 over 3. It's fine. And of course, on all three together, it's going to be equal because they're normalized, so I get 1. Okay. Sorry? Is the, so, um, what? It's just yeah, just ordered. Yeah, I, I, I used the, the arrow to just represent the vectors, but ordered. And this will be just the, um, the elements of it. Yeah. So typically, what I would do is like, if I, well, if I was writing this, I would use bold on these because of the vectors and then use um, no, normal to indicate values, but yeah. Wow. That we will see that, yes. Um, yes, so before I, I go on, so now th this is this is clearly an ordering relation. I have an ordering relation between two vectors, but uh, it is not a total order. It's only a partial order because there are always cases where um, there are some vectors that are not comparable. So for example, if I have V1 is equal to this one, 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.25, but V2 is 0.4, yeah, 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. You cannot actually, so they're already ordered because they're also already in decreasing order. But now here I don't have a relation because if I just look at the first element, then 0 0.5 is greater than 0 0.4. But if I look at the first two, this is 0 0.75, this is 0 0.8. So this is now the larger one. So they are not related by majorization. They are not comparable. Uh, which means that this is a partial order. It's not like greater than or equal to with real numbers. Okay, what are the extreme versions of majorization? Well, you see, the, the best thing I can have, if, if I want my vector to majorize every other vector, then the best thing I can have is that you just concentrate all of the population in one of them. So let's call this uh, W is equal to 1, 0, dot, 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 however long it is. So that's the best because this is ordered and now the sum of any sum that I take will always just be one because I already have one. 
whereas the other one I would call identity over D, this loosely speaking, is the one where I have all of the population equally split among all of the elements. So these are both, so W is in RD, and let's call this U, which is also in RD. And so what we have then is for all V in RD, it's always going to be the case that W majorizes V, because for W, all of the partial sums are always the greatest possible value. They're already one. Whereas it's always going to be the case that V majorizes U, because U basically has all of the sums as small as possible that they can be. If I try to make any of these elements smaller, they would just get pushed to the end, which would increase the sums in the beginning. So the only way to make the sums best. Yes? Yes. Uh, yes, in in fact, yes, it is. It is when it's um, so. In the case when we talk about energy, uh, for example, minimizing the energy because of passivity, there then when we have strict majorization, we know that one of them will have a lower energy, strictly lower. Whereas if it's just only major, only if it's an equal to, then it means that the energy may be equal to. Yeah. Yes. No. Yeah. Because uh, and and here I, I really follow the. Um, I'm following the convention because majorization is well defined, so they use it for for greater or equal to, as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. So these also sort of give you an intuition as to what majorization uh, tells us about. What it tells us about is how concentrated the population is in a vector, because you see the the vector that majorizes everything is basically a pure state. It's all in one population, and the the vector that's majorized by everything is the one where the populations are equally distributed. So it's sort of the mixedness of a vector. So in fact, um, majorization is quite a useful tool in a lot of uh, fields, including economics. If anybody's interested, you can look up um, Lorentz curves, where Lorentz is not the physicist, so it's Lorentz, but without a T at the end, so you only have the Z, who was an economist. And one of the things that he used majorization for was to um, talk about income inequality. Because basically, if you if you basically arrange the, uh, take, take the vector to be the incomes of each person in a, in a country, and then that's the entire vector. And if you arrange them then in decreasing order and you look at these partial sums, it gives you an idea of what the comparison between the top level of incomes are and what the comparison between the bottom level of incomes are. And so then if you have that one country's you know, income vector majorizes, so if income vector of A majorizes the income vector of B, that clearly, clearly means that inequality in A is, is greater because it means that for every group of largest incomes that you talk about in A, more than that. So it's quite a useful, uh, concept. Why is it useful for us? This is the question. Okay, so 13, 14. Probably going to have to take linear optimization to this next class. So um, one of the properties of vectors that are majorized by one another is the following. So A majorizes B if and only if A, oh, sorry, B rather, is equal to D times A, where this is a stochastic right, uh, I forgot one of the letters, so doubly stochastic transformation. Okay. What is a doubly stochastic transformation? When you write it as a matrix, it's, um, it has a property. So you have dij in such a fashion that, so of course dij is greater or equal to zero for all ij. And you also have 
that d, the sum over i of dij um, is equal to one for all j, and the same way the sum over j dij is equal to one for all i. So this means that when you look at it as a matrix, the rows all sum to one, the columns all sum to one. Okay, so good. Um, and the nice thing about doubly stochastic transformations is that in turn, so this is one statement, but the other statement that we can make is that D is always equal to the sum over N, let's call it B, no, let's use a different letter for that, U, U is good, UN, PN, and these P, are permutations. So Pn, the elements of Pn belong to either zero or one. So a permutation, well, permuta this is really a normal permutation where you, you look at the populations and you reorder them. So when you look at the matrix that does a permutation, it always just has zeros and ones. Um, in it. And it is, of course, an example of a doubly stochastic transformation because clearly you, um, when you do a permutation in every row or column, you have a single one and everything else is zero. So it satisfies the property over there. So, and oh, the QN, the QN are basically a property distribution. So they're greater than zero and sum over N QN is equal to one. So this is a statement that you can always decompose any doubly stochastic transformation into a mixture of doing permutations. Okay, so uh, actually this, how well versed you with the concept of a polytope? Was that done in the QIT lecture? It was mentioned. Okay, um, so one of the ways of looking at this, uh, at this set of W stochastic transformations is, um, if you look at the matrix elements of a W stochastic transformation, they are, let's say it's, it's um, Let's say sort of dimension d, so you have d squared numbers. You can always plot these numbers in a d squared dimensional space, right? So it's just a, it's a real space of d squared dimension, and you can plot these numbers. And what this statement is telling you is that the extreme points of this set are the permutations. So they are the, the ones where they are almost all zeros and some ones, and everything else is going to be within it. So if you, if you write down these permutations and you put these as points in this, in this geometric space, then the, the figure that you get, which is the polytope, this is basically the, um, the generalization of a polygon in two dimensions where you just connect all of those points. The entire volume inside is the entire set of doubly stochastic transformations. So that's another visual way of looking at it. It's not critical for our course, so, but um, yeah. What I would suggest you look up is, this is called Birkhoff von Neumann. So if you look this up and at associated topics, you would get a lot of information about stochastic transformations. Good. Okay. And then for our final thing, why is this useful? This is useful for the following reason. So I'm going to talk about the optimization of linear functions, but before that, Let's do, let's just review something. Yes? Yes, so this is the point where the, the vectors are equivalent. Because when you do, a, so yeah, indeed, because when you do a permutation, you haven't changed the ordered form of the vector. Because when you order them again, you'll have exactly the same elements in decreasing order. So a permutation does not, so if A is a permutation of B, then indeed A majorizes B and B majorizes A. They are, they are equivalent in terms of majorization. Exactly, yeah. And indeed, so strict majorization then means that you are strictly within the polytope. You're not at one of the permutations. Yeah. Although, okay, if you, um, you could be within the polytope and still be equivalent if you have, so for example, if I take the, uh, the maximally mixed vector, then of course, no matter what, I do want it, it'll always remain the same. So of course, then the entire polytope is trivial. So when they're equal elements, one has to be. Yes. Yeah. 
Yes. So the, the ambiguity is only in the case where you have a vector, who, some of whose elements are equal to one another. Because then you have the possibility of doing a transformation in that space that doesn't actually change the elements. Yes. If, if you, if you, so indeed, whenever you have a vector that all of whose elements are, uh, are unique, then the only way you can stay equivalent is by permutation. If you ever do anything else, uh, you will, well, you will go within in the majorization order. Okay, so just a, a recap of a linear function. This is something very simple. So if you, and, and I do it on vectors, so f of, um, it's linear if I can say f of, let's say c, c1a plus c2b, where a and b are vectors, is so a, b within rd is equal to c1 f of a plus c2 f of b. Okay, so that's just the normal definition of linearity. Okay, so. Now, why is this important for us in thermal? It's because all observables in thermal, when we write them, are actually, well, particularly the energy, are linear functions of the eigenvalues of the observable. So the energy, if I write down the energy of a state, so E average, I can write it down as trace of H rho. But this, as you know, I can also write down in the form, just take the diagonal elements of rho in the energy basis and multiply them by the energy, so En, Pn, which I could also, if I wanted to, write it down as E, P, where E is sort of a vector that I make from the energies and P is the vector that I make from the populations. So the energy is a linear function, right? So now, what do I want to do with this? Yes. So imagine now that I have, so this is now going to link to passivity, but I will only get that to that in the next lecture. So consider now the equivalent for vectors. So imagine that I had a vector V, and what I'm allowed to do is do any doubly stochastic transformation on it. So I can take it to V prime, which is equal to whatever doubly stochastic transformation I want times V, okay? And my goal in doing this is to minimize a function. So I want to minimize some function F of V, where F is linear, okay? So what do I do? Well, I'm going to write down F of, okay, so let me put this, minimize F of V. Let's see if I can finish it in this space. So I write F of V prime. This is F of DV prime, but I use the Birkhoff von Neumann. Uh, sorry, DV, thank you. Uh, I use the Birkhoff von Neumann. I split D into all of its permutations. So I can write it as sum over N, QN, PN acting on V. Okay, so the, in the first step, I just have this. But now linearity works because multiplying matrices by vectors, this is a linear operation. And then I have the linearity of the function F. So of course, at the end, I'm going to get sum over N, QN of F of each PN times V, okay? And now this is a convex combination. So it's a mixture combination of, so the Fs of P and V. And the same way as we had with virtual temperatures, although there it was just convex combination of, of um, two things, it doesn't matter. Whenever you have a convex combination of an arbitrary set, you will always have that the value that you get is going to be within that range of the set. Which means that now when I want to find out any, any extremum, so either the minimum, which I wrote down here, or the maximum under these transformations, all I have to do is look for the permutation that minimizes it or maximizes it, and that's the one I'm going to get. So if I want to, so to recap, if I want to find the extreme values of a function on a vector under any doubly stochastic transformation, all I have to do is actually look among the permutations and find which one is going to give me the minimum and which one is going to give me the maximum. Um, and so, so five minutes, can do the most trivial example. So. Yes. 
So do I say my, my A and B? Nope, they're not written anywhere. So consider my A is 0, 2 over 3, 1 over 3, and that's just it. And I have my function F, and I'm really trying to link this to energy. So you can imagine that A are the populations in ground, first excited, second excited state. And my F is really, um, or oh, I can, yeah. So my, my F is E, not A, that was a vector where E are the energies, and that's going to be zero, let's say E and two E, but E is greater than zero. So I have written it in, in increasing order. And so now I say, well, minimize E dot A, well, A prime, where A prime is equal to D A. Well, then from this, from the theorems and the thing that I just wrote down, we only have to look for the permutations. And when it comes to energy, especially when we write energy in order, the permutation is actually trivial. We know that if, if I write the energy in increasing order, I want the maximum population first, second, and then third. So very clearly, A prime is going to be given by putting the greatest population in the bottom, then the next, and then that one. Because I just, I put the minimum population in zero, the next population in the high energy, and then I'm going to get, yeah, E dot A is, well, whatever it is, E over three. Okay. So the combination of all of these things means that when we are looking at the populations, we can just go look for the pretty much obvious permutation to minimize our energy, which is the one that gets, which is the one really that orders us so that we are passive with the greatest ones in the, in the lowest energy state. Okay, um, however, this is all so far classical. So now I'm going to state the Schurhorn theorem. The proof will be next lecture. What does the Schurhorn theorem tell us? Very simply that. So, so take, so imagine that we have, so if I have two vectors, I'm gonna call them H, uh, let's write them in vector form, and lambda, which are both d-dimensional vectors, and such that lambda majorizes h. Okay, so I have two vectors like this, lambda, h and lambda, lambda majorizes h. Then there exists, oh, keep writing it in the weird fashion I'm used to. So there exists some Hermitian matrix H such that lambda is the eigenvalues, eigenvalue vector, you can say, and H is the vector of diagonal elements and also the converse is true, so, and vice versa. So this now links all of this back to quantum mechanics in a very useful manner. What it tells us, so the first direction is actually not the one that we use uh, so much. The, the converse direction is the one that's more important to us. It tells us that whenever we take a Hermitian matrix H, and remember this, of course, this includes density matrices rho, because they are, of course, Hermitian, then we always have the relationship that if we look at the vector of eigenvalue, uh, sorry, the vector of diagonal elements, which is something that's basis dependent. So depending on what basis we choose, we'll get different diagonal elements. But whatever vector we get from that, that vector will always be majorized by the vector of eigenvalues. So the vector of eigenvalues has a special place. It will, no matter what unitary transformation you make, you will always have that, sorry, yeah, no matter what basis you look at it in, lambda will always majorize the diagonal elements in that basis. And this is in turn useful because what we have, one of the most important properties of the unitary operation is that, so lambda, if I write lambda as a, as a function of the density matrix rho, this is equal to lambda of any unitary transformation on rho. Because remember unitary operation, it changes, your, it's a change in basis, but it, it leaves all of the eigenvalues of the uh, density matrix the same. So this is particularly useful because when we discuss passivity, 
we consider all unitary operations, but now we know that there is something that remains constant throughout, it's the set of eigenvalues, and we know that the diagonal elements in the new basis, which is what we will be looking at when we calculate the average energy, those will always be majorized by that vector of eigenvalues. And so when we start the next lecture, we will now return to how to see the definition of passivity from this. So this is actually something you can think about. Now, how can I use this argument to say, well, actually, I can see now that my density matrix can only be passive if it has no coherences and if um, it's ordered decreasing in the, in the energy basis. Perfect. So with that, I conclude the lecture. Are there any questions in this part? Yes? Maybe I missed part of the argument, but I'm not sure why. Well, maybe it's just in the proof and it's not obvious here, but I'm not sure why we can go the other direction. But given a Hermitian matrix, yes, we know that it is. Ah, uh, it's 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 in the in the proof. Yeah. The proof. yeah, yeah. So I haven't done the proof uh, in this lecture because the, yeah. the converse of this state wouldn't give you that. The because here. Ah, you, sorry. Okay. Some matrices have majorized eigen value vectors and diagonals, but it's not always that it's always actually right. It, it, yeah. So any if you if you just start with the other direction where you just go, I have a Hermitian matrix, and then you look at the eigenvalues. So okay. I, in this thing, I would only really work with density matrices row. So I'm really only working with vectors which, which don't have negative and stuff. So for that, for sure, that is the case. So if I have a density matrix row, which is not just permission, but it's also positive semi-definite, then actually, I, perhaps I would, Philip, do you know this small question? Do you know whether it's true for any Hermitian matrix that if I take eigenvalues and, and diagonal elements, the matrization condition holds? Maybe I'll I'll check before next lecture. I know for sure it's true for, for density matrices. It's, it's an if and only if in the statement. Of the shoehorn. OK, then it's true for all Hermitian matrices. Yeah. yeah. Great. Thanks. Any other questions? Good. All right, then, uh, yeah, see you next week, Wednesday. <laughs>